welcome to tonight's ICAD Insights. My name is Mindy Johnson and I work with ICAD. Um, we are a platform dedicated to expanding knowledge, exchanging ideas, advancing well-being, as well as looking at the prevention and treatment of behavioural, mental and emotional health issues. We facilitate open dialogue and learning and we do this through our communications network, which consists of online resources, including articles written by prominent professionals within the mental health and addictions fields. You can find out more about ICAD at www.icad.com. Today, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Susan Broderick to ICAD Insights. Susan is the founder and CEO of Building Bridges to Recovery. She's an expert in the field of criminal justice and recovery and has experience on the front lines of the justice system. Susan, thank you so much for joining me here tonight. Oh, thank you, Minta. It's a delight to be talking with you. Um, well, your presentation in particular, actually, of all the sort of presentations that are going to be on offer at ICANN, is one of the ones that really jumped out to me and, and really excites me. Because when I read the abstract and saw the, the kind of description of this idea of better than well, I was fascinated. And I'd never heard of the of it before, but it kind of struck a chord in me. And, and I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more about this idea and what do you mean when you say better than well? Sure, absolutely. Um, well, to give you a little bit of the background, I um, was a prosecutor in New York City and it was when I was a prosecutor that I decided to um, go to meetings because I knew I had a problem with alcohol but I had all the different reasons out there to justify why I wasn't an alcoholic. For example, I would you know, rely on the fact that I didn't have a, deep, a driving while intoxicated, but I didn't have a car in New York City. So that really, that excuse went by the wayside. And um, so I was fortunate enough, I went to a, my first meeting on July 15th, 2001, and I have not had a drink since then. And I knew, from my work as a prosecutor that so many of the cases that I worked on involved people who had problems with drugs and alcohol. And so I moved down to the Washington DC area back in 2003. And in 2010, I went to a conference and I met somebody who really changed the trajectory of my career and that was Dr. John Kelly. And John Kelly was talking about recovery and how the criminal justice system can provide that motivation to make the changes, you know, because very often people are referred to 12 steps or to treatment because of interaction with the justice system. And I knew that to be true on a professional level because I had seen that with so many of the people I worked with that, that very often the arrest or the referral is that bottom. And so I, I just really, John's work spoke to me and I've been working with John ever since and I'm fortunate to be on his advisory board. And one day we were talking and I said, you know, John, I know that you study recovery, but for me, it's been a miracle because I didn't go to treatment. I didn't, you know, I didn't have everything fall apart. And in fact, you know, I haven't had a drink since my first meeting. And to me, that's a miracle. And John's response was, well, maybe it's a miracle or maybe you had very high recovery capital. And I was like, what is recovery capital? And then when I looked at it, um, I started looking at the research around it. And basically recovery capital refers to the individual, social and community factors that have been shown to not only help initiate recovery, but sustain it. And when I looked at my own life and my own recovery capital, I realized I was indeed very fortunate. I, I came from um, a regular family, but I, I was a pretty gritty, resilient person. And the social support I had when I made that decision to get sober was amazing. My family was very supportive. My friends were very supportive. I was really lucky because I was in New York City. Um, meetings were available basically 24-7. So the, the idea of recovery capital really resonated with me. And then about three years ago, I was working on a paper in response to a lot of the push that, well, addiction is a disease and you can't um, put people with the disease through the justice system. And I said, well, wait a minute, because 
it's a disease, but it's not a get out of jail free card. And, and even whether it's a disease, a condition disorder, I don't, I don't know. There's still so much we don't know about addiction, but we are learning more and more about recovery. So I started writing, I wrote a paper called Love, Hope, and Random Drug Testing. And I talked about the way that we can use the justice system and use that leverage in a positive way and use it to make that referral a turning point for somebody. So not using draconian sentencing measures or things, but using um, the justice system as a way to help enhance people's recovery capital. And a lot of time people who find themselves in the justice system might have low personal recovery capital, but um, the social and the community capital can still be there. And very often it can be used as somewhat of a scaffolding to build up that individual recovery capital um, in the beginning. So it was then when I started coming across all the work by David Best. And David and I are both on John's advisory group, but I hadn't met David in person. So I reached out to John Kelly and said, could you introduce me to David? I know we've been on phone calls, but I don't know him one-to-one. And John just paused and said, why didn't I think of this before? The two of you should be working together. So David and I had a phone call in June, and he told me he was speaking in Ireland that September at Trinity College, and I was like, I'm going to go. <laughs> so I went over, I met David in person, and since then we've been working together. So David's work, David is a criminologist who looks at the parallels between recovery from addiction and desistance from offending. And... I, on the other hand, I haven't, stu- you know, I don't have a PhD. I had to look up what desistance meant. <laughs> and I was like, well, it's reduced recidivism. But, you know, our work really um, goes very well together because David has studied all of this and really I've, I've lived it. I have like a PhD in, in life. And um, so it's really been wonderful. David and I have presented together Um, a number of times last year. He was over here for the National Drug Court Conference. This past November, we um, opened the Tennessee Recovery Court Conference. And so the idea of focusing on strengths and assets and letting people see that recovery is not only possible, but it's probable. The prognosis is very good. And one of David's studies, and this is the one that really had a big impact on me, he looked at the quality of life of people who had five plus years of sobriety. And, you know, with most people, if we have something wrong with us, we go to a doctor and we just want to get better. We want to go back to what we were. We want to go back to well. But the beautiful thing about recovery is that we actually transcend that and we get better than well. And we don't go back to what we were when we first came into sobriety or recovery, but we transcend that and we become the person we were supposed to be. And I can tell you that the day that I read that study, it touched me at such a deep level because I knew it was true. I, that's exactly what had happened in my life. Um, ever since I was a little girl, I dreamed of growing up and being a lawyer in Washington. And you know, for years, I my drinking, you know, I, I wasn't going, down i you know i still had a good job i was still you know but i wasn't really achieving my full potential and it was because of getting sober that i was able to do that and it was when i had two years sober that i made the decision to come down to dc and be a lawyer in dc and i've done that i was so lucky because i came down i was working with the da's association then i went over to georgetown i was at georgetown for 10 years and, and that was incredible because that exposed me to the research and gave me a better understanding of, you know, what research means and, and looking at research findings and be able, being able to look at, you know, what does this really mean and is it biased in any way and things like that. Because having worked as a prosecutor, I did, you know, I've cross-examined a lot of experts and I realized that sometimes, you know, data can be manipulated. So I I love the idea now that I um, have a much better understanding of the research. And what I'm trying to do now is bring that research to the people on the front lines, especially in the justice system. Because one of the things that we all know is that addiction 
doesn't care where you sit in the courtroom. So it doesn't matter if it's somebody who's been charged with an offense, somebody who's a victim of an offense, somebody who's a witness, or maybe it's the judge or the prosecutor or the defense attorney. Um, so that's what we'll be talking about at the conference. David's gonna talk about the work he's doing at a prison in the UK. And then I'll be talking about how we're bringing some of his work over here and um, working to bring it into the justice system here in the US. Wow, that's uh, it's all. Yeah, that was a lot. I'm sorry, I did, there wasn't a lot of back and forth there. I was like, blah, blah, blah. No, it's, it's amazing. It was just, there's so much to take in. I had so many questions that I sort of- sort of Oh, sorry. <laughs> Especially, I mean, first, I just want to say that I completely, you know, it resonates with me so much when you say um, this, the idea of this better than well, and that you become, with a certain amount of years of recovery, you become that person that you were meant to be, you know, that like, that touches me on a really emotional level. I, like, I feel that deep down, I think, because that's, again, becoming, is my experience too. And, and I hope, you know, in another 10 years, I will be 10 years, you know, further into my potential, you know, and get and keep growing in that potential, which is, yes. which I never felt I could do before, because I think uh, addiction was always an excuse as to why I couldn't, I had put myself on a pedestal from a young age, perhaps, because of, I felt that this, I had this potential, but I couldn't fulfill it because an addiction was my excuse for that, really. And so um, that's what happened for me. Um, but the other thing, I, what I wanted to ask about the, the presentation and the research and everything, you mentioned um, the justice system being able to help people with their recovery capital. Uh, and they yes. might, you said they might not have very much personal recovery capital, but they might have some social recovery capital. But how exactly can the justice system help with recovery capital? So one of the projects that David and I are working on, um, he's developed a tool called the RECAP. And so the RECAP, not only, it, it does three things, basically. It is an assessment of your recovery capital. And based on that assessment, um, it generates a report that highlights the recovery, um, the areas where you have strong recovery capital and those barriers that are, you're facing. So, um, for example, the program that he's doing over at Home House in, outside of London, they're, they're doing this um, assessment within the prison. And then based on that report, they are targeting those different areas. So they're building up, you know, strengthening, because that's the beautiful thing about recovery capital. All of those factors are dynamic, so you can build them up. So where there are low recovery capital, and for people in the justice system, very often it's educational issues, vocational issues. So working on strengthening those. And so having the justice system involved, especially working with people who are coming out of the justice system, and targeting those areas where we know as part, like here in the US, we're doing a lot around reentry. So when people are coming out, making those positive connections within the community. So connecting them, not only with recovery support, which is so crucial, but also with sober activities, sober um, peer groups, because you know it's really hard when you're coming out, whether it be treatment or the justice system, and realizing you can't go back to the same people, places, and things. So using, um, educating the probation officers and the correctional facilities about how important making these connections are. So one of the projects that we're hoping to do up in Boston is to pilot David's program. And one of the places we're gonna pilot here is the, it's called the School of Reentry. So it's um, a group of, um, people within the justice system, they have about a year left on their sentence. And Governor Baker in Massachusetts has created, and it's more of a school, it's not as much of a prison. And so during that last year, they're given um, a lot of education courses, they actually have even college professors coming in, they do a lot of vocational training there. And they also have community supporters coming in. And what David's doing in the UK is training the family members and the friends about the recovery capital of the individual. So letting them see where they can be out in the community already making the paving the way for those recovery connections for when that 
um, exit from the justice system is happening. So it, it really takes everybody working together. And so I think that the justice system, you know, plays a part of this. Obviously, they can't do it all. Um, but by raising awareness of those within the justice system about looking at the strengths and assets, because for so long, at least here in the United States, our justice system has been so focused on the negative and the deficits and the risks. And, you know, and that's important, but it's not the whole conversation. So I know the research has also shown that by looking at strengths and assets, it's really important because those are stronger predictors of long-term stable recovery. So helping to change that mindset within the justice system is really important. And that's what's going to lead to both, you know, recovery, better recovery outcomes, but also better desistance outcomes. Because the two really go hand in hand a lot. A return to addiction very often can mean a return to offending. So we want to do, by looking at the recovery capital, recognizing it, building on it, we're doing things to help build their recovery and to promote um, a life where they don't have to be involved in the justice system anymore. I mean, yeah, I completely, I can, it sounds like an amazing sort of idea and, and, and I hope it's something that works, but I think I sort of, I still can't, when you talk, I can't get past the idea, I suppose, of the fact that I think about you and me perhaps in our recovery and like you say, we had, I probably did have, regardless of what sort of family support I might or might not have had, I probably had a strong recovery capital in the sense that I, I had a really good education. I was financially stable i you know i had the support of people around me so that i wasn't going to be you know i might have had the threats of homelessness and all that kind of thing or my child being taken away from me but it never happened because of that support that i had and i think a lot of people you know i went and worked within um uh, over here we have sort of um uh, local government funded drug and alcohol services and I worked with a lot of people in that and I set up a charity myself do, working with, with people in in prisons, addicted prisoners. Setting up, I did a magazine. I still have that magazine. And, and I just know from my experience of working with them is that their backgrounds and their, and it is, as you say, their recovery capital are completely different to mine. And their, right. it, it was, it's frustrating because, you know, I can say, look, you need to get some purpose. You need to get some of this. You need, this is what you need, connection, social peer groups. All of this stuff worked for me, but I feel like I was already in a better, I had a better vantage point than them. Right. Oh, absolutely. But I, I think the beautiful thing about this as well is I, I've met a lot of people within the justice system. As a matter of fact, it's a, it's, it's a little crazy, but when I had, I had five days of sobriety in New York City and I went to a meeting that Friday night, I lived in Brooklyn and they introduced the speaker and they said, um, this is James and he started his road to recovery in the Brooklyn House of Detention. And I was like slipping down in my seat. I'm like, oh dear God, is this is what my life has come to? I'm not going to have anything in common. He's a criminal. I'm a prosecutor. And he spoke in his story touched my soul. And I went up to him afterwards. I had tears streaming down my face and I just hugged him and I said, we are the same. And, and I think, and that's the peer to peer component because it doesn't like the outside stuff. It's, you know, it's important. And I do get it, you know, the homelessness, I haven't been homeless either, but there are people who have been homeless. There have, there are people who have not had the educational opportunities or the vocational opportunities that we have. But people who have been through tremendous adversity are some of the strongest people I've ever met. And I think what's critical to really igniting that spark in people is giving them hope and letting them see that they can do this. And that's where I think the whole concept of peer to peer recovery is so important because there are so many people out there who have been in the justice system who had nothing, who have completely turned their lives around and they are the greatest examples of hope. So I might not be the best example for somebody inside a prison, but there's plenty of people 
who have been on the inside who have made that turnaround. So there's a nonprofit I'm on the board of here, the Phoenix, and most of our members, I think it's about 67%, have had co some contact with the justice system. And in fact, one of our members, she's actually a regional director now, she, she was incarcerated, she was involved in a fatal car accident um, where she took somebody's life and she was sentenced to prison and it was in prison that she made that decision, she needed to turn her life around. And she came out, she now works with the criminal justice population and she is a living example of your criminal justice history doesn't have to define you, your whatever has happened in the past doesn't define you. And, and I think giving people hope and letting them see that they do have potential and they have, you know, their potential is there to build that social capital to connect them with other sober peers, very often other sober peers who have been in the criminal justice system. And, and one of the things I learned, and this was, I got sober and basically a lot of bad things in my life happened. I had 57 days on September 11th and I then, I had breast cancer twice and both times the doctors missed it, but I pushed for more tests. And it was during that time that, you know, I didn't really, I, I listened to the doctors, but the people that helped me through that Ill illness were the other breast cancer survivors. And they were people who were living proof to me that I could do this as well. So I think it's more about looking what we have in common and, and it's that, you know, we, we have an affliction. We, we cannot, you know, I cannot drink, uh, you know, and that for me is, and, and I know there's something that happens to me when I do take a drink and there's a way I connect with people in recovery that I don't connect with on with people on the outside. Um, and to me, there's still an element of miracle in this and the spiritual component is very big for me, but on a very practical level, I think there is so much to be said for looking at strengths and assets because for a long time, I think the focus of a lot of this work has been very negative and has been like, oh, the problem of addiction, oh, this, and people are dying and not talking about, like here in the United States, we have over 23 million people in long-term recovery that the prognosis, um, the latest numbers show it's a good prognosis. The majority of people who seek help eventually do get sober. Not everybody does it immediately. Some people relapse, but there is a lot of good news to share and people need to hear that because that also generates the hope. You know, and one of the things, I was at a um, retreat last year and it was a yoga recovery retreat. And one of the lines I heard is that the difference between illness and wellness is I versus we. And it really is true that they're together and just that connection that you have with others can generate so much um, momentum in your recovery journey and can build up that individual strength and can build up your self-esteem and your self-efficacy and feeling confident that you can do this because you're seeing other people, you're with other people that are doing it as well. I mean, I can feel you're so right. And it's so, it's amazing to hear someone, you know, in your position, talk like this, you know, because you don't, there aren't, as you say, so often it's not, it's all about the negative and all about the sort of the pessimistic outlook. Um, and I think, yeah, I, I'm I'm just inspired, really, if I have to say, I and mean, that's how I feel. Um, and what the last question I think I want to ask before I ask you if there's anything you want to add is is you talk about this idea, this need, in fact, for this to work, everyone has to work together. So the justice system has to be able to work with the families, and the families have to be able to work with the peer groups, or the peer groups have to be able to work with the justice system, and all these dots need to be joined. And I, historically, that doesn't, hasn't ever really been able to work. And I, it's always, again, it has been a real frustration of mine to, to think no services seem to want to talk to each other. I don't know if it's the same in the US, but in the UK, like no services will help. And I think it's because of probably money. You know, I think there's a right. lot of gold that they're all trying to get, but actually, the end goal needs to be the service user and that person who who we want to get well, but 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 it's 
so difficult to get those people to talk to each other. So what, how, how can you combat or have you got a way of combating that? So I, I think that with the Phoenix, that's an example I can give. So the Phoenix is basically, it was the brainchild of a man, Scott Strode. And Scott went to treatment, he was 24 years old. He had been using drugs and alcohol since he was 11. He went to treatment in Boston and he came out of treatment. And that's when he said, you know, he looked around and he said, I can't go back to the same people, places and things. So he went to a boxing gym and he said he soon found that his identity changed. He went from being an addict to being an athlete and his social group changed and his community activities changed. And he then moved out to Colorado and in 2000, he started just inviting people from 12 step meetings to come and have fun because that's the other thing, you know, when we send people to treatment or we talk about recovery, we take away the drugs and the alcohol, but if we don't fill that void and give people meaning and purpose, they're going to go back to it. So recognizing the need to fill that void and it's going to depend on the person. So that's where, you know, I, another colleague of mine, he started a nonprofit called Recovery Branches. And he, he's on the Phoenix board as well. And he's the chief, he just retired as, the, he was the chief development officer of Subway. And he has 32 years of sobriety, but he was a guitarist before he started working at Subway years and years ago. So music is something that is very important in his recovery and really ignites his soul. So his idea with recovery branches is let's find all those different activities. Let's find what people truly love at a soul level and fill that void with that. And I think what's happening here because of the opioid epidemic, which is, it's so much bigger than just opioids though, but the silver lining has been that we're finally talking about addiction, but not just addiction and recovery. And we're recognizing that there's many paths to recovery but the one thing we know for sure that none of us can do this alone. So we need to work. If we really truly want good outcomes, if we want people to not just survive, but to thrive, we have to work together. And I'm seeing a lot of that and recognizing that there's, I think there's a genuine spirit out there, especially among, uh, we have a lot of recovery organizations here in the US and there has been you know, there's certainly silos sometimes, but I have seen probably over the last three years more of an attempt for us to really collaborate together. So I think that's good news. And the other thing I'll mention, today was um, a great day. I don't know if you read in the papers, but John Kelly issued um, in the Cochrane Journal this incredible new research article. It's a study they did and in finding that AA ha is... Um, better than a lot of the other treatments out there. And so many people, you know, can badmouth AA and say whatever they want. And it's hard, it's always been hard to defend AA, but now we have research that's backing it. So I think more and more, we're looking at the solution rather than the problem. And I know as a prosecutor, that's what I was, I was a solution person. It was like, okay, whatever happened in the past, what are we gonna do about it now? And to me, the whole idea of recovery capital, recovery support, focusing on the solution, focusing on the fact that people can and do get better, they get better than well. I think this is the part of the conversation that we haven't had. And I think truly think that this can be a game changer. I completely agree. And I'm just, Susan, I'm blown away. Honestly, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. You've got, oh, everything you say is, you know, what I always hope and dream someone will say you know and it's backed up the most important thing is people say it but you're backing it up with research you know and that is the you know the epitome that's what's needed so that, that people take us seriously you know absolutely because we as you say you've got a phd in lived experience and that's great but without that you know research that 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 that, that people do say, okay, well, they won't, they won't listen to us, even though we know it's right, you know, and, right. and, and you're coming with, with armed with everything. Now you've got a whole exactly. arsenary of, of, of everything that we need to sort of make this difference. And I think it's, it's wonderful. And, you know, I'm really grateful. And it's been absolutely, as I said, an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Oh my gosh. I'm, I'm thrilled. I couldn't, I, 
you know, one of the things I'll close on is when I had um, breast cancer, so it was in 2007 and 2009, so I had, you know, um, several years in recovery. And I remember when I got the second call and I was with my mother and I collapsed in her arms. And I said, why is this happening to me? And, you know, all I want to do is live happily ever after. And that night I called my sponsor and, you know, I told her what happened and I'm hysterical crying. And she said, once again, I think the stars are aligned for you. I'm like, well, could you explain that? Because I'm not seeing it. And she said, how many people get to save their own life two times? And in fact, in both cases, I pushed for more tests because the doctors told me things were fine. And I'm like, I knew something wasn't fine. So when I, and then it turned out I had to have a double mastectomy um, about 10 days after that uh, second diagnosis. And I was getting wheeled into the operating room and I was crying. And one of the doctors took my hands and he said, you're gonna live happily ever after. And I was like, oh God. And then I had to go up to Sloan Kettering in New York for more tests. And I had sent my medical records up. And when I walked into Sloan Kettering, um, the doctor came out with his whole entourage. And he's like, I'm Dr. Andrew Seidman. I've reviewed all your records. And he put out his hand. And he said, and I'm here to tell you, you're going to live happily ever after. And I'm like, OK, this is, spooky. <laughs> this is amazing. And so then fast forward this past October, I was invited to come over uh, to Ireland to speak at um, a conference, to give a keynote at the Tabor Group. And I was able to bring my niece with me, who's 17 years old. And so the first morning in Ireland, she was still up sleeping and I was um, journaling. And I said, you know, because I journal to God every day. And I said, you know, 10 years, because it was 10 years ago since my double mastectomy. And I said, 10 years ago, I said, I wanted to live happily ever after. And you've given that to me. Here I am in Ireland speaking about recovery at a conference in Ireland. I'm from my, you know, my grand, great grandparents are from Ireland. And I said, this is just amazing. So the next day, Rowan and I were at a castle visit and we were going around exploring and I went into the back room and there was a room where they did weddings and there was a sign on the door. <laughs> and it happened <happened> after. <laughs> just like oh my god and and I truly feel I feel so blessed because you know I knew the moment I met John Kelly back in 2010 that you know it's something that you know at a soul level I just knew it I was like I have to work with this man and and then meeting David Best and just the way this has all been unfolding there's so much of it that you know I'm really just following how this unfolds and I couldn't think of a better way to be spending my time right now because it, my pers pers uh, personal and professional lives have aligned and I, I just feel so grateful and so blessed. So I, I, I still can't believe I'm getting to come to London and speak at ICAD and it's, it's going to be great. So I'm excited. What's the season thing? I mean, I'm in, I'm in tears. You, you, know, you really touch me. It's like, yeah, everything you say and just how, as you say, everything sort of the coincidences and the, this that idea of, as you say, you journal to God or whatever it is, it's higher power that I definitely think sets us up on the course when you are in recovery, when you're living your life right, you know. Exactly. Um, right. And then I'm finished, I don't know if I told you, well, I don't know if I put this in the bio. So I just finished writing a book um, and it's called Make Mine a Double. <laughs> It's about my recovery from addiction and how it got me through everything, including a double mastectomy. And, and it, you know what? Because I look back, every single thing that happened that I thought was the worst thing in my life turned out to be a turning point and one of the best. You know, believe me, I, I didn't think it was a great day when I was walking into that first meeting. And I basically thought my life had come to an end. Like, this is where fun comes to die. And I couldn't have been wrong. It's the best decision I ever made in my life. And that's where I'm very open about it because I want other people to see just how joyful and amazing this life can be. Well, I think we're going to leave it at that, Susan, because that's exactly the sort of note we want to end this uh, iPad Insights on. But thank you so much. It's been an oh, absolute real pleasure speaking to you. And I know that everyone who's watched this is going to be desperate to come to ICAT and uh, hear more from you and Professor David Best, you know, just, and see sort of what we can implement in the future for our, 
our, everyone in recovery really to make sure that Absolutely. we are all living uh, better than well. Um, so thank you very much. My name is Araminta Johnson and you have just joined me at the most recent ICAD iTalks. As always, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you and my guests here today. If you'd like to access any other resources, you can do so at www.icad.com. Thank you and see you all soon.